Cassie. Hi, Caitlin. This is PNW Haunts and Homicides. Yes. Episode two for Dayton Leroy Rogers. Yes. I'm yes. so excited. I know. I kind of I was really <laughs> trying to build it up because I really was excited about this episode. Um I don't know. That we'll get into it. I'll explain why okay. I was so excited. I really nerded out hard. I like when you nerd out hard. Yeah, I nerded out so hard. <laughs> also, I kind of went full blown background horror on this one too. Yes, you know that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. It was difficult because we're going to be talking about um, like the legal proceedings and his court cases, mm. and um, you know I'm definitely interested in that, but some of that really required me to like dig in deep and kind of. Try to get to the bottom of like, what the heck does this mean? So, um, yeah, because you know, I'm not going to know. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm going to do my best to kind of explain some of the proceedings and um, we're going to get into some Oregon law. Ooh, fancy. Yeah. We are going to get legal up in here. Nice. <laughs> so, we're going to start with the tarot reading still. Okay. This will be interesting. We were short and sweet with it in the first episode, mm -hmm. I think. Um, well, the card was kind of short and sweet, too. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think the interpretation made sense, but. Oh, one popped out. Oh, <laughs> two, two popped, popped out. out. <laughs> I like that. If it's two, it doesn't count. <laughs> if it was just one, I might have read it. Okay. Let's do one more shuffle. Okie doke. My hair is stuck in the cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Jesus. They are it. really stiff, but we're I getting there. Them, They're getting I gave better. Them a pretty good shuffle. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna cut it. Cutting. Cutting. Okay. Should we go with this one? I feel like this one. Oh, this is so funny. So in the first episode, the card was the emperor in reverse, and this is the high priestess. Oh, in and reverse. we've gotten that one before. Yeah, we have. I'm gonna turn in. The modern witch book that goes along with this deck. There's that. And I'll find the other um, interpretation in, in the big book while okay. you're and this taking is a looky. The interpretation of the card just as is, but we did draw a reverse. So just keep that in mind while I'm reading this. So there are deep secrets and many mysteries in life. The high priestess knows the path towards them. She sits on her throne with her laptop full of secret knowledge and wisdom, pensive but inviting, which is Caitlin. <laughs> um, behind her, a veil of pomegranate suggests the desire for answers is there, but we may not be ready to lift the veil of these mysteries. The moon at her feet seeks to awaken our unconscious and open us up to hidden things and the strangest parts of existing. Be still. Sometimes the greatest power comes in knowing that you do not know anything. Oh. I always love that line when we read oh my it before. Gosh. I was like, that's the okay. best. <laughs> we, have, we have pulled this card yeah, oh, for recently. Sure. And I'm just guffawing at that line already because I'm seeing I'm seeing the connections. And, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. right. Continue. You've come up against the truth and more self-knowledge is needed and it's time to reflect in order to grow. Explore your subconscious through meditation, through tarot itself, through study. It's not time to make big decisions right now. Interesting. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to read from the big book. I'm going to break from tradition on this cuz yeah, I think it. this is really interesting. Okay. <laughs> so the high priestess secrets mystery the future as yet unrevealed. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh. The woman who interests the querent if male, the querent herself if female. Silence, tenacity, mystery, wisdom, science. And that's in the upright position. In the reverse, it's passion, moral, or physical ardor, conceit, and surface knowledge. <sighs> okay. Huh. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna get right into it and we're gonna we're gonna come back to this at the end so that you guys can kind of see where we make some connections. 
All right. So recall from a previous episode that Dayton Leroy Rogers was sentenced to death for the murders that he commit in addition to that of Jennifer Lisa Smith in August of 1987. I had stated in our previous episode that he had been on and off death row for decades already back in 2006. Yeah. His attorneys filed a number of appeals. As if you didn't already, go ahead and get ready to hate his smug, stupid face. Hate him more. Yeah. (laughs) We're about to get into some of the details in the series of court battles. I can tell you that as someone who debated going to law school... Mm. Instead of getting an MBA, <laughs> this miserable bag of fuckface, misogynist garbage juice energy <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> is one reason I'm glad I steered clear because I would have almost certainly pursued criminal law, followed by a lifelong drinking problem. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I thought you already had one. So, yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. It's not a problem at this point. But It's not a problem yet. This case could drive a woman to drink. All right. Oh, she's holding her wine. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just take a... Just, you know, guys, if if you got it, pour it. Full disclosure, I'm eating a macaron right now. (laughs) I grabbed one in the middle of her talking and I was like, shit, I'm going to have to react with macaron in my mouth. (laughs) That's all right. You know what? You can take a break. Have a macaroon break, and I will. I will get into this. I feel like you're gonna, your commentary is gonna be at the at the second half of this. Okay. So eat all the macaroons you want, my darling. Um, Oregon's legislature decided to virtually eliminate the death penalty in 2019. Oh, I didn't know that. I was just about to say, if you didn't know about this, there is a very good reason for that. Hmm. Instead of taking this measure to a public vote, Oregon's death penalty statutes were rewritten so incredibly narrowly that almost all aggravated murder convictions would no longer qualify for the death penalty. Wow. Now, for myself, personally, I'm a little bit conflicted about the death penalty, um, Mm -hmm. but I do think that this specifically speaks to kind of a sneaky sort of an action on the part of the legislature. I don't think that a lot of people were very happy about this. We will get to it. Ooh, okay. So when the legislature was debating this new law, assurances were made in the public record that this new law would not be retroactive. It's going to be really important here. Okay. Okay. What is retroactive? So when a law is retroactive, just in case, um, you know, you're kind of wondering what exactly that means, it means that it will apply to cases that have already been tried. Okay. Okay. Got you. Retroactive in this instance for a lot of people is going to be problematic. Okay. So, however... The law was not written so that it applied only to crimes committed on or after the date of the law's passage. So what this means is the law, despite the promises previously mentioned, is in fact retroactive. In fact, the way that the law was written would even possibly change sentences for cases that were pending at the time. Yeah. So there's some serious implications there, obviously. Dayton Leroy Rogers was first tried, convicted, and then consequently had been sentenced to death by a jury in 1989. He tortured, raped, and murdered these women, and their pain had sexually aroused him. The most prolific and notorious seller... (laughs) Seller? I was just trying to pro- just combine serial and killer into one word. He's a siller, <laughs> apparently. The most prolific and notorious serial killer in recorded Oregon history had been sitting on death row awaiting execution for more than 30 years. Well before committing these murders, Roger's criminal record detailed a long list of horrific crimes. So we talked about this last time. I'm not going to go into a lot of details If you want to know, you go back and listen to episode one if you haven't already. His crimes included violent physical and sexual assaults against women that he either decided not to or didn't manage to kill. On three separate occasions, 
in the preceding decades, Rogers' death sentences were overturned by the Oregon Supreme Court. Of course, all of the court decisions were based upon legal technicalities rather than a presumption of innocence. Hmm. So this is important because there has never been any question about his guilt or his extensive criminal history prior to his conviction. Yeah. They're not saying he's not guilty. This is not a, you know, making a murderer. He is not Brendan Dassey. Thank goodness. Yeah. Because, like... No, that's too confusing. I just want to clear that up right From the top. (laughs) In one instance, his death sentence was reversed because the trial judge attempted to protect the names of the jurors from both Rogers and the press by assigning numbers rather than using their names. The court's efforts failed to keep their names secret from either of these parties. I mean, I'm sure the whole jury wanted to be named to the public at large, let alone this monster. (laughs) Jeez. Apparently, that was enough for the Oregon Supreme Court to give Rogers a new death sentence hearing, to which I say, what the fuck? I mean, I... I, I just don't see how that... It. I, yeah. Um, y- you know, and I'm no legal expert, obviously. Um, you know, <laughs> was pretty clear about that at the top. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just not sure why that really meant that he needed a, a new... Um, hearing for his death sentence. Um, In 2015, a new jury made up of residents of Clackamas County reheard the evidence and quickly resentenced Rogers to death, which this is really crazy to think about just having recently been summoned by Clackamas County. Mm. So kind of for me, it's, you know, it drives home the importance of, you know, if you're called and you're able to serve a... Honestly, I was grumbling all the way because it's kind of a huge inconvenience. You do, but you yeah. do it. Yeah, it's your but you duty. do it. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, the date of my summons, there were no jury trials. But lucky, I digress. Lucky ducky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was the fourth time a jury in Clackamas County had unanimously sentenced Rogers to death for his heinous crimes. In keeping with the pattern of pushing his luck, (laughs) the sentence was brought back in front of the Oregon Supreme Court to review for a fourth time as well. If they once again decided to reverse his death sentence, according to the new law, Rogers would never be subject to a death sentence again. Ooh. Yeah. Dayton has said previously he would waive appeals if the death penalty was taken off the table and he was guaranteed a true life sentence. Prosecutors, however, have said that the waiver wouldn't be binding and Rogers could elect to ignore it. So I really liked what one of the alternate jurors um, in that 2015 um, you know, trial had said about this. So I just wanted to share that. Um, This person explained that it wouldn't have persuaded them. The fact that he's saying he'll waive his appeals. um, And they said, do you take a chance on that? Just like those girls took a chance when they got in Roger's truck. Oh, snap. Yeah. Clap back. Um, I just I think it's a very valid point in my mind. So Um, John Foote, who had served as the Clackamas County District Attorney since 2001, stated in an opinion piece, the legislature has refused to allow the voters to determine the fate of measures that they passed at the ballot box. HB 3078 reduced sentences under ballot measure 57 for serious repeat felony property offenders. HB 1008 removed violent older juvenile offenders from ballot measure. HB 1013 is the new death penalty legislation. The new death penalty law takes effect on September 29th at the time of this statement. We call on Governor Brown to fix this quickly. A lot of my notes for this episode were based on his summary of the court proceedings, as well as SB 1013 from 2019. As of March 5th, 2021, Ooh, shit. the Oregon Supreme Court had reviewed the appeal via Zoom, because duh, COVID, yeah. COVID. <laughs> and I quote, the direct and automatic appeal, whether defendant 
who has been sentenced to death for six murders that he committed in 1987, should have his sentence reversed. Issues on appeal include challenges to the jury selection process and the trial court's evidentiary rulings, as well as the effect of SB 1013-2019. So this is basically just a summary of what they were discussing in that Zoom call. Um, you can actually review it in, in full in a video case file. So Ooh. we'll include a link in the show notes. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, it definitely, it's interesting, um, but if it's not your cup of tea, you know, don't worry about it. But uh, I just thought that was interesting, wanted to share something that, you know, you'd have to, <laughs> you'd have to go digging for like I did. <laughs> it was fun. We'll provide it for you. Yeah. <laughs> so at the time that we recorded this episode, I could not find any indication that a decision had been made and an opinion released to the public by Oregon Supreme Court. Oh, okay. If we get any news on that in the coming months, we might just have to do an update. Um, I don't think it's unusual given the implications of the decision as well as the COVID restrictions that we've been dealing with for the last decade um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we haven't heard on this. So, I, I mean, I, I think that it can take a quite a while for all of this to be finalized and official under normal circumstances. Um, on the one hand, these are really serious cases, of course. So, um, you know, that can be viewed as a good thing that they're obviously taking the time. But I also look at the fact that this has been reviewed so many times already and an almost unfathomable amount of taxpayer money and time spent. And that's a little bit frustrating. Anyway, we're curious what people's thoughts are, especially if you've gotten in with the courts. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. Who hasn't in? <laughs> <laughs> we know this will have to go through the official channels, but um, I, honestly, I just, I can't wait to see how this turns out. Because um, looking at this, it's like, wow, do the wheels of justice turn slowly and painfully? Oh, so slowly. So slowly. Because, I mean, look at this. This is... In our lifetime, <laughs> before the start of our lifetime, this man committed all of these heinous crimes and was caught, tried, convicted. And now, as you know, we're in our 30s, we Gosh. are still debating about whether or not <laughs> whether or not this man is gonna be, you know, left on death row or That's not. That's crazy. Do you know how old he is now? Um, I don't know. I mean, it would be really easy to check, but I I really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, like, yeah. is he going to die in prison before this oh, he, is all handled? I, I, I mean, I think there's a strong possibility. Um, normally, I would say, unfortunately, um, COVID has been rampant in our um, prison system. But I can only hope that, you know, maybe he gets a really violent case of it at this point. Yeah. So. I wouldn't be sad about it. Yeah. So that's kind of a... Um, just the legal background, and if you guys didn't know about any of this stuff, I felt like there's a really good chance that probably most people didn't really didn't. realize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and I consider myself someone who, you know, likes to be well informed about, you know, what's going on in my state, and it was something that I, I really didn't have an awareness around either. And after everything that's happened – um, in this case and, you know, unfortunately to these victims and, and their families and, I mean, even his family, the way that they were victimized, it just feels incredibly painful that this is drawn out to this point. It, it's, oh yeah, you know, I think we're used to hearing about criminal proceedings really being a long drawn out process. And on the whole, I do think that that is for the better because it gives us more time to hopefully get it right. Um, mm -hmm. in this case, uh, I, <laughs> I start to veer into, um, a different side of my, uh, of my personality that says, okay, um, does anyone know if old Sparky is still operational? <laughs> <laughs> Just that's, strap him in. That's kind of where I'm at with, with Dayton. He's so obviously guilty, like. Right, the, and the, and there's really not any debate about yeah. whether or not he's guilty. So just so do that's it. the part that <laughs> that frustrates me, and and the fact that he's so obviously afraid of that punishment versus spending the rest of his life in prison, 
I just, you know, it's like, I'm sorry, I don't even really on the whole support the death penalty, but I don't think that he should get to choose. <laughs> no, definitely not. And the fact that we've been, you know, dragging this out in our court system for this long, um, and it's a little bit frustrating. So mm-hmm. um, now I also want to share another side of this case that I thought was just honestly too compelling to leave out. Um, This comes from Oregon Live, and so this is um, going back to episode one where we talked about the importance of language. I'm going to read this, um, you know, pretty much as it is. So just know that some of these word choices, I'm going to point them out and say this is, I'm not selecting this particular uh, term. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to read it without crying, but I make no promises. Oh, God. No, you can't cry because then I'll cry and then our listeners will cry. And then you're all going to cry. Cry, 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 cry. Tons of creepy tears. So honestly, though, these are amazing women in this story, you guys. Mm -hmm. So when it gets to that point, I'm not crying. You're crying. You're all crying. (laughs) Okay. So as her thoughts turn to renewal and hope each spring... Sherry Letter would call the funeral home to ask about the murdered prostitute. Again, don't love this term. Um, (laughs) Sex worker is probably the most appropriate, I think, in almost any situation, um, depending on who you ask, of course. (laughs) Um, For 26 years, the answer remained the same. The young woman's family never claimed her ashes. They languished in a simple urn stored on a shelf. But Letter couldn't forget Jennifer Lisa Smith. The two were forever connected by what happened one night in 1987. That Friday in August, Smith's screams brought Letter running out the door of an Oak Grove restaurant where she was talking with a friend. Letter saw the 25-year-old Smith lying naked in the parking lot the final victim of Dayton Leroy Rogers. Letter knelt beside the bleeding woman, trying to staunch the flow from the wicked stab wounds, telling her to hang on until help arrived. Mm. But Smith died at the hospital. The killer had taken off in his truck, chased by a man in a car. (laughs) Rogers raced through Milwaukee and Gladstone at speeds up to 100 miles an hour. But the man was able to note the license plate to the pickup, and deputies arrested Rogers that afternoon. A fingerprint matching Smith's right ring finger was found on the inside of the truck's passenger door. The case led to Rogers' conviction, and he's now in the Oregon State Penitentiary. Letter, 32 at the time, learned that Smith's body went to Finley Sunset Hills Mortuary off U.S. 26. She sent flowers and a card to the funeral home for Smith's family. I expressed my sorrow, she recalled. I wanted her family to know that she was a brave woman who fought for her life. I wanted them to be comfortable to know that she wasn't alone. I was there with her. Smith's family never replied. After six months, I called the funeral home, Letter said. The card and flowers hadn't been picked up. Her ashes were still there. When she checked again six months later, no change. All of that made me not want Jenny to be forgotten. So I started calling the funeral home each year with a sense of hope that her family picked up the ashes. I prayed for Jenny and her family. Each year, the same call, and each year, the same answer. I felt such profound sadness, Letter said. No one cared, but she did. Now, this article was last updated in 2019 after its original publication in 2013. So in late February, it was time to call again. The ritual had become her way like the way that some people light a candle in a church to honor Smith's memory. Long ago, Letterhead realized the similarities between their two lives. 
Now 58, Letter had once worked for the Portland Police Bureau's Vice Squad. She was 19 and earned college credit and a bit of money to pose as a hooker. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm just oh. quoting the article here. We say sex worker. Um, to help cops arrest customers who trolled for women like Smith, known on the streets as Gypsy Rosalind Costello. Wow. <laughs> Letter knew that no girl decides to grow up and be a prostitute. Smith had been forced to make some terrible choices to survive. And in 1983, when Letter was in her late 20s, a man broke into her southeast Portland home and sexually assaulted her. Oh, my God. When she managed to escape, the intruder, later caught and convicted, chased her down, stabbed her five times, and beat her in a parking lot, breaking her collarbone and smashing her head onto the pavement. What? This year, Letter made the call with a sense of urgency. Cancerous tumors have spread throughout her body. While doctors plot a course of action, Letter, divorced with a daughter and granddaughter living near Lincoln City, feels time is precious. The clock is ticking, and I'm not sure how many ticks I have left. Her own people never came to get here. When I go, everyone will have forgotten about Jenny. Letter said she started to recount her tale to the funeral home receptionist and was transferred to Yvonne Menzanella, the mortuary manager hired six months earlier after moving from California. The call seemed strange, Manzanella said. It was almost hard to believe the story, but there was something in her voice that touched me. Dayton Leroy Rogers dubbed the Malala Forest Killer. Uh, was found guilty in 1988 and 1989 of killing seven prostitutes and dumping six of their bodies in the woods near Malala. He's been on and off death row ever since while his attorneys have filed a series of appeals. Jurors heard graphic details of how Rogers drove his victims along old logging roads in the Mount Hood National Forest south of Malala then shared vodka and orange juice with them. <sighs> While engaging in sex, he hogtied, stabbed, and tortured the women, mm. even sawing off some victims' feet. No. Before getting into the funeral industry, Manzanella had worked as a 911 dispatcher in Northern California. One call in particular haunts her. A young woman was being attacked and got away to call for help, she said. I took it. She was on the phone with me when the attacker chased her down. I heard her die. Oh, God. Manzanella took Letter's telephone number and said she'd get back to her. After checking the internet to verify Letter's account of Smith's murder, uh, Manzanella found a ledger book in the mortuary's office safe. She flipped through the pages and found Smith's name. Her unclaimed cremated remains had been at the home longer than anyone on record. A file showed that in 1987, Smith's parents had paid to have the mortuary take care of their daughter's body. When they didn't pick up the remains, the funeral home left messages and sent certified mail. They never responded. At a certain point, the mortuary decided to wait for them to come forward. Manzanella was moved by what she found out. I'm a mom, she said. I would hope that no child is ever forgotten. She was also impressed with letter. Here's this woman who has been carrying this burden for so long, she said. The right thing to do was to do something for both of these women. Manzanella took the story and the records to the funeral home managers. Her bosses were amazed that someone who wasn't a family member had cared for so long. They donated a niche in the ornate mausoleum 
and provided a bronze faceplate engraved with Smith's name, birthday, and the day she died. When the paperwork had been completed, Manzanella called Letter. They planned a memorial service. Letter said she'd be there along with two members of the clergy she asked to say a few words. But about 15 minutes before the service, the receptionist told Manzanella that Letter had called to say that one of her tumors had put pressure on her adrenal gland, causing her blood pressure to skyrocket and her heart to race. As a precaution, doctors wanted her to spend the night in the hospital. Three days later, when Letter felt better, the funeral home held a second memorial. Oh. <laughs> As services go, it was the smallest in the funeral home's history. Letter, Manzanella, and a couple of employees, one of whom would screw the faceplate over the niche, <laughs> standing before the wall where Smith's remains would be laid to rest, Letter reached into her purse and pulled out a small piece of blood amber in the shape of a heart that she found at the beach more than 25 years ago. Aww. She opened the urn's lid, set the amber inside, and closed it again. This, she said, goes with her. After the urn was placed in the niche and the faceplate solid, Letter walked to her car and pulled out 25 white helium-filled balloons. Each one represented a year in Smith's life. She let them loose. Fly, Jenny, fly. Oh. <laughs> so. Stop it. <laughs> Aren't you glad I ended it with this one? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll include a link for this <laughs> article as well. So people can see the beautiful picture of Sherry Letter releasing these balloons oh. to honor the life of Jennifer Lisa Smith that was cut tragically short. I just thought that was really beautiful. It was. Like, yeah. just the whole thing. I can't, like, I don't have a lot of words, but. <laughs> <laughs> Mouth words are hard when you're just, like, moved to this much yeah. emotion. I just thought it was really beautiful. It's incredibly sad what both of these women went through in their lives. And it's incredibly sad that Jennifer's family never claimed her remains. And I, I don't know what reasoning they maybe have for that. I can't. It's a tough one because on the surface, I really do. Um, <laughs> my gut reaction is very angry. Yeah. Um, but they, you know. People, people grieve in different ways and um, react differently to you. I, there's no way you could know how you oh, would react no. as as the family members of a victim in this situation. But um, I just thought it was a really beautiful story that you know eventually someone really did something incredible. And and you know, like the article said the managers of the funeral home were just really impressed and they were touched by the fact that this woman, um, you know, cared about w what happened Yeah. in the end. You know, this wasn't somebody that was a family member of hers. Um, but I think it would be impossible to have literally, you know, been kneeling there in the parking lot at Denny's as, Jennifer is, you know, unfortunately just really in a horrifically painful way passing away and not have that stay with you. Oh, yeah, of course. Like but to be able to do something beautiful like this and I <laughs> – my heart stopped when I read this article for the first time and they talked about letter – suddenly having some health issues and I thought god damn it if she dies before they can have this fucking memorial service I am going to lose my ever loving shit yeah like we're not reading this yeah anymore. I was this like you guys it just it just got too dark but um yeah that was um I I actually I thought about taking that out because it's a little bit of a <laughs> that felt a little bit like a jump scare, but um, 
I just thought that was really, really cool. Um, you know, she was already, she's going through her own grieving process in a way, um, dealing with her own mortality and yeah. illness. And I just ugly cried when, you know, oh. she said, after I'm gone, you know, no one else, no gonna... one else will remember her. Yeah. And so, I mean, just the, I, I thought it was an incredible story and I do think um you know, the the picture's a little bit old and it's probably somebody's flip phone <laughs> picture yeah. but um but it's really beautiful um they did they did capture Sherry releasing the balloons um oh. so I thought that was that was really cool I'm so glad that they the funeral home was able to do that for her like yeah I don't know what kind of laws are in place for if you're not a family member, what can you do to like bury you or have a memorial. Right. But I'm so glad that they figured it out and they were able to do that, especially like waiting and doing like a second memorial service till she could make it. Like that's the whole point of doing this. Yeah. This was as much for, you know, this poor woman to kind of have closure on this, you know, horrific thing that she witnessed and you know as much as a um a funeral home just like any other business it it's a business but they really i was impressed that you know they did something really really nice and basically were like this one's on us yeah i thought that was really cool it so. shows that they really care about what they do which i mean if you yeah own a funeral home like hopefully you hopefully really really you care do. yeah yeah so um I, I mean the the timing for me was just really interesting too because we're looking ahead to um in a couple of weeks um finally being able to um do a little bit of a memorial for um for my family um for both of um my maternal grandparents mm. finally um they will be interned together so i was Aww. like it just i needed i needed to believe that that was that there was something that was a that was a happy ending about this story right yeah. now so it was an emotional um thing to kind of go through and put together this second episode but i thought it was really beautiful so it was <laughs> hopefully we're gonna have to see how much i quaver <laughs> <laughs> it was good uh yeah <clears throat> i managed not to ugly cry uh while we were recording it but oh man did a really good job <laughs> <sighs> okay <clears throat> so i'm gonna go the high priestess in reverse Secrets, mystery, the future as yet revealed. I think that, you know, for a lot of years, just in a very small way, it's sort of been this mystery for at least for um letter yeah. to wonder whether, you know, this woman's family would, would claim her remains. It's, you know, that's definitely the future as yet unrevealed, but um <sighs> In the reverse, the interpretation, passion, moral or physical ardor, mm. conceit and surface knowledge. And it's just, you know, she obviously felt so passionate about this person that, yeah. you know, she really, she just had this, I mean, it's horrific, but this really fleeting encounter with, you know, this really short-lived, but <laughs> then at the same time, this very long-winded and and lasting, a very enduring, um, you know, memory of, um, I don't know. I mean, that kind of has me a little bit choked up, like yeah. a little bit lost for lost for words on that one. But uh. <sighs> I don't know. I I hope you guys agree that this this kind of helps to to turn the tide. This is just a, I mean, a story, like I said, of two really incredible women just trying to, in some small way, like, find closure and to try to do what they felt was right for someone who really endured incredible suffering and just to really um, 
to honor the victim's memory. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I couldn't believe that uh, this many years later that she was finally getting, you know, a memorial that finally, befit, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm sure she's really thankful wherever she's at. Yeah. She's yeah. flying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really sweet. I thought that was really sweet. Fly, Jenny, fly. Oh, my God. Yeah. I just, every time I look at the picture of her, I just picture her <sighs> releasing them and just, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not making that up. That's, that's what she, that's what she said. Yeah. She, they, they were there to witness the, and that's what she said. It was like she was finally setting her free. So That's so sweet. So long overdue, but. Kind of in a way setting both of them free. Like, yeah, you know, she's. I mean, this was obviously something that, you know, God forbid she was going to take to her deathbed and that was going to just, you know, really eat out a piece of her soul. So yeah. I'm glad that she was able to do that. It was important to her. Mm. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. All right, you guys. We really struggled with figuring out how to end this really emotional episode. And this is a little bit of a departure from us because we definitely try to keep things light and we like to just make fun of the assholes that do these horrible things. But we're going to um, continue in the lane of <laughs> a total <laughs> departure and we want to end it on a different note this week. Yeah. All right. Fly, Jenny, fly. So for all of you that are listening, if you have any true crime or paranormal stories that you want us to share, maybe with the whole Pacific Northwest. Yes, we would love to read them on the pod. <laughs> yes, we will read them out loud. <laughs> Not just in our heads. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to be from the Pacific Northwest if you would like to share. Email us at PNW Haunts and Homicides at gmail.com. It's all spelled out, no special characters. Super duper easy peasy. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Same thing as the email at PNW Haunts and Homicides, all spelled out, no special characters. Please also rate and review us on whatever platform you're listening to and check out our stories on social media because our meme game is hot. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and if you agree, like Caitlin, you can also find us on Patreon and support the show. Bitchin'. <laughs> Now I'm very convict I'm I'm <laughs> Now I'm very conflicted myself. Hold on. You're going to have to say that again. Okay. Cuz I said, told her she was looking at the carpet. Where is she? Wait, is that I'm oh, sorry. That's Charlie. <laughs> Molly. He went that. She went that. Where way. Are God are damn. You going? No. You were in here now. You cried to be in here. <laughs> you want to come sit in my lap? You're a legal dog now. Okay, don't make piggy noises into the mic, okay? Thank you. You're so cute. I'm going to rip your face off. Okay. <laughs>